it's a real revolution in terms of investment banking and finance in general, we'll unfortunately see the consequences of a lack of control, of anarchy. There will be scams. There will be plenty of people who run around and um, defraud people because they know they can. I think this is going to be one of the great fun challenges to explore. If we can accomplish that by 2030, I think that the cryptocurrencies will have become the greatest innovation of the last 500 to 1,000 years. Hi, I'm Charles Hoskinson, Chief Executive Officer of Input Output Hong Kong. Uh, we're a cryptocurrency company and a research firm that specializes in the science of cryptocurrencies. So I first became interested in cryptocurrencies in 2011. I read a, a wonderful white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto, and I had known about peer-to-peer -peer technology for quite some time. Uh, for example, I knew about the BitTorrent protocol and Napster and these types of things, and I noticed the evolution of um, the technology. So it was really interesting as a, uh, as a paper, really interesting as an idea, but I really didn't think that it was a sustainable market. I said, oh, well, we have these imaginary tokens. Who's going to buy them? Will they ever achieve liquidity? And even if they do that, the government will just shut it all down. So I didn't take it too seriously until about two years later, uh, right around 2013, when I noticed that despite the fact that the system had taken many hits and scandals and other issues, that it exhibited a tremendous amount of resiliency. And then from there, I said, boy, it would be really interesting for, for me to do something in this space. But I didn't know anybody. So I, I remember an old adage one of my, uh, my professors said, which is those who cannot do, teach. So I created a free class on Udemy called Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto because I'm a big Peter Sellers fan. And so I kind of named it as a spoof on Dr. Strangelove. And I just created a bunch of free lectures. I released them as a Creative Commons license that I expected maybe a few hundred people to take the class. Well, it turned out I got over 70,000 students for the course, and uh, I uh, got over 5,000 emails in the first year that I hosted it, and I answered every single one of them because it was a fun experience. So I got to meet everybody and got to learn a huge amount. The venture I'm usually most known for is Ethereum, which I started shortly after setting up Invictus Innovations with Vitalik Buterin and several other people. So to understand Ethereum, you have to understand Bitcoin and what problem Bitcoin solves. So Bitcoin is all about saying, can I create a money system where Alice and Bob can transact with each other in a trustless way and with a decentralized database recording all those transactions? So in other words, when Alice sends that transaction, it gets recorded in some magic ledger in the sky, like a giant spreadsheet in the sky, that once it's in there, it can never go out. It's tamper resistant and it's immutable and it's time stamped and auditable. So that's a wonderful concept and that alone with the notion of digital scarcity allowed a currency to form. But the minute that you have a currency, people immediately start saying, well, what else can I do with it? Is it just the ability to move value between Alice or Bob? What about the story behind that value, the metadata, the context, the contractual relationship? For example, what if Alice says, I'll mow your lawn if, uh, if you pay me $100? Well, that's a contract. So what if Alice mows the lawn and Bob doesn't pay her? That can't be reflected in a system like Bitcoin. So what we wanted to do is add a programming language to a blockchain so that these bespoke custom transactions could be coded much the same way someone would write JavaScript in a web browser. And that in turn would allow people to have any type of financial relationship that they wanted to have very simple relationships to arbitrarily complex relationships. So this was kind of the naive notion that we had in 2013 for, uh, for Ethereum is, can we add a programming language to a blockchain so that we can then allow people to facilitate more complex commerce uh, known as smart contracts? The best projects are projects of frustration. So most of the people who started Ethereum, they didn't start and say, hey, we're just going to go build some magic new blockchain and it's going to have all these capabilities. And they did this in a clean room in a very academic way. They all started working on other projects. For example, Jeff was working on Mastercoin, Vitalik was working on Color Coins, I'd been working on BitShares. And each and every one of us had the same scenario where there was something we wanted to do. But the nature of blockchain technology or the nature of blockchains that had already been deployed made it very difficult and time-consuming and expensive to do these very simple things. So we had to say, there must be a better way. 
So what, what occurred was that Vitalik started aggregating really good ideas, ideas that he learned from Sergio Lerner, ideas that he learned while working on color coins and master coin, and kind of stitched them all together into an initial white paper. Then, like all open source projects, that attracts attention uh, if it's a good idea. And so we started appearing out of the ether uh, and discovering, hey, this is an interesting thing. I'd like to help and collaborate. And then somewhere along the way, uh, we decided that it was a good idea for everybody to meet each other. So really the turning point between this is a discussion about a cool thing we could do to something that we actually wanted to devote time, money, and effort to was in January of 2014. We, uh, most of the Ethereum founders met up in a beach house in Miami for the North American Bitcoin Conference. It was a wonderful trip. And we had an opportunity to really seriously discuss not only the technology and what it would require, but also the philosophy. What are we actually trying to do? Now, from that, we'd reach an internal consensus that this is something we'd like to pursue, but you can't just build a product in isolation. You have to actually go show it off and see if anybody cares. So we thought we were all crazy. You know, we'd show the world and they'd say, ah, we don't care about this stuff. And you know, there'd be no interest and we'd just all go home and go do something else, maybe start a bakery in Hawaii or something. So uh, what we did is we, uh, we went to the conference, we did some presentations, uh, Vitalik presented at the conference, and I did a debate with Dan Larimer and uh, David Johnston. David represented MasterCoin, Dan represented BitShares, and uh, I represented Ethereum. And uh, we, we got almost like a, a Mick Jagger-esque rock star reception to uh, our presentation. Vitalik, for example, right after he presented, was mobbed by people, and it took nearly an hour to pull him out of that uh, circle of people who had questions. So we realized that we had something very, very special. The problem is then, uh, now we, we have momentum, we have something special, we have a group of people that are willing to do it. You very naturally go to the next question, which is how do you do it? Where do we do it? You know, how do we execute? And that was the, the hard part, the, the devil in the details behind Ethereum. That's a long story, but I'll try to make it concise. So after Miami, we took a vote and we tried to decide whether we were crypto Mozilla or we were going to be crypto Google. And these kind of met two different things. So crypto Mozilla is saying, let's do a not-for-profit organization. Mozilla is the maintainer of Firefox and projects like that. Crypto Google is a great patron of open source software, but ultimately it's a for-profit business. So these are very different models and they have different notions of how these things ought to operate. So we took a vote and initially the vote was eight to zero for all the founders said crypto Google is the way to go. So I went to Switzerland and we started uh, examining how one would set up a for-profit venture that would build a protocol and launch the protocol through a not-for-profit foundation. So I lived in Zug for several months. We got tax rulings and did very complicated work all in German, which was quite fun. Uh, I ate a lot of pretzels and gained a lot of weight. Uh, but, you know, that's how these things always operate. And then uh, somewhere along the way, uh, around June of 2014, uh, we eventually had to make some hard decisions. And uh, the decision was made to reverse that and move to Crypto Mozilla. And some people left the project, myself included, as a consequence of that. And the remaining people set up a foundation, did a crowd sale, and moved on. So I never thought at that point I'd ever get back into the Ethereum space. I said, well, you know, my time is over. I, I enjoyed the six months I was there. I learned a lot. I, I met a lot of interesting people. I enjoyed the beautiful vistas of Switzerland. Uh, so it's time to go do something else with my life. So I suppose the easiest way of thinking about an ICO is it's just basically a mechanism, a decentralized mechanism for somebody to raise capital. It's a very neutral thing. It's not a pro thing or a negative thing. It's just a gateway that allows capital to flow in. So the very first ICO that was done was MasterCoin. And uh, the beautiful thing about this mechanism is just how incredibly simple it is. So with MasterCoin, the founders of that project just listed a, a forum post at Bitcoin Talk. And they said, hey, we're doing something interesting. If you like it, send some Bitcoin to the specially formed address. And that was that. And that's basically what occurred. And they raised half a million dollars in a month. And everybody was just blown away. They said, wow, I can just create a forum post, put an address up, some text, and then suddenly half a million dollars appears. So that's the basic notion of it is this idea of saying, hey, I'm going to do something. Here's how you pay me. And then using a cryptocurrency as the value transfer mechanism. But more broadly, an ICO is, is, has become formalized because there's now a lot of more tools and functionality and interesting things that one can do. The first ICOs were all kind of meta to the system. You had a Bitcoin as the value carrier, but all the terms, the conditions, the liquidity, all these things were kind of outside of the system itself. 
So somebody had to go and build MasterCoin and then find a way to issue a token in MasterCoin. It was a very bespoke, time-consuming process. It took months. Now with Ethereum, what Ethereum has allowed people to do is to find that once. It's called the ERC-20 standard. And then they can take that ERC-20 contract, issue as many tokens as they want, and then go ahead and issue a sale. People swap Ether for ERC-20 or what have you. So what this has allowed people to do is it's kind of democratized access to this new fundraising mechanism. Uh, it has allowed thousands of people to raise billions of dollars all throughout the world without actually having to physically meet the people that they're raising money from, uh, and in some cases not even knowing who they're raising money from because it's being done over the internet through these types of payment systems. So it's an incredibly interesting mechanism. It's like crowdfunding on steroids. It's not an entirely new concept. We've had things like Indiegogo and Kickstarter for years. The difference is that now Indiegogo and Kickstarter have been disintermediated and also that the payment system itself no longer goes through the standard financial system. So banks and financial intermediaries are not involved. It's now a direct peer-to-peer -peer payment system between people. So this obviously causes uh, a lot of regulatory questions about how this model is going to survive, thrive, and stay within compliance, given that the legacy system never imagined that such a system like this could exist. First, the magic of ICOs is that they have now made everybody equal in terms of their ability to raise money. There's never been a time in human history where we've had this power. So, you know, ordinary days, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur or get venture capital, uh, you have to go where the money lives. So that's New York, that's Silicon Valley, that's London, Beijing, Tokyo. There are certain cities where uh, that kind of value aggregates and the people who dispense it aggregate. So you go and come up with your great idea and go on the road and go live somewhere. Well, for a certain group of people, that's a perfectly fine proposition. The young and the affluent or those who are in a position to take a risk. But let's say that you have a brilliant idea. Maybe you want to run a decentralized grid. Perhaps you're in uh, Haiti or in uh, Puerto Rico or somewhere and you've just had everything destroyed by a hurricane, and you say, instead of rebuilding an old, stupid grid, let's build a really good grid, and maybe with solar or something like that, and have the people on it. Well, that may be a wonderful idea. You might have a great business model. There might be a lot of passion behind that, but the issue is you have no access to capital. So your only option is to either fly capital to you, which seldom occurs, uh, it's luck usually, or you have to leave and then find a way to somehow bring that back home and build relationships. So people in the developing world or people outside of these zones have historically always been at a disadvantage. What the ICO does is say, your geography no longer matters. Many ICOs have been done from very small countries like Barbados, the Cayman Islands, uh, Switzerland, and so forth, and have been able to raise money on par with what you would expect from Silicon Valley and from New York and these other large capital hubs. That's a very powerful, very prominent, very amazing thing. But with great power does come potentially great problems. Some of these offerings could be construed to be securities offerings, especially where these offerings require centralization for the end product to work, or they have no product that they're selling and they're using it to finance the construction of the project. Uh, so as a consequence, it's very unclear about how legacy laws will fit into this new fundraising model, and also unclear about what jurisdictions ought to take uh, precedent. Normally when one raises money, they raise money in a particular place, let's say California. Then you would say as an entrepreneur, I have to keep the state of California happy and I have to keep the U.S. government happy. Those are the two constituencies. It's manageable. Lawyers know how to do this. When you do an ICO, you could end up raising money from 10,000 people in 200 different jurisdictions. In some cases, jurisdictions on embargo lists like North Korea and, and Iran. So in that case, how do you actually manage that? Or do you even know who your customers are if you're not doing know your customer and anti-money laundering compliance? So these are some of the great challenges of ICOs is that while they increase liquidity and they put everybody on equal footing and it's a real revolution in terms of investment banking and finance in general, it also introduces the issue that there is a gap of good governance, good regulation, and uh, good compliance that would allow people to produce a good outcome for these things. So anytime there are contracts, markets, transfer of value, and uh, an expectation of return or a potential for fraud and abuse, 
uh, there is universal consensus that there needs to be some notion of governance behind that and recourse in the event that people fail to meet their obligations. So the role of the government, at least in a Western sense, is to be the arbitrator of last resort. It creates levels. It says, okay, well, for markets that are very efficient, work well, and are generally not filled with fraud, the government does tend to stay out of those markets. But for markets where there's just too much temptation, there's conflicts of interest, agency failures, these types of things, in those marketplaces, the government feels necessary that it, it has to have some form of a role. So this is kind of a contrast between, let's say, journalism or things involving written content and the financial markets. In the first case, it's completely unregulated. Most part can say whatever the heck you want to say in the United States, and everybody just finds a way to deal with it. Whereas in the financial markets, they tend to be the most regulated of all markets, not because we started that way, but because we've had consistent collapses, from collapses in the 1880s with gold deflation to the Knickerbocker crisis in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century to, uh, again, another crisis in uh, the Great Depression uh, to the crisis in the 1970s, the SNL crisis, uh, long-term capital collapsing, the you know, the uh, dot-com bust, uh, the Enron scandal, you know, you can just keep going down the line. And in every single one of these instances, usually what occurs is the government says that there was some area that we probably should have been regulating or understand a little bit more about, and we now are going to step in. For example, Enron it resulted in the creation of Sarbanes-Oxley, whereas uh, in the 1930s, they decided to create Glass-Steagall to separate retail and investment banking. And both of these were probably pretty good ideas within the context of society. So there are two modes of thought on should the government have a role or not. One of them says, yes, the government ought to have a role, and that role ought to be very hierarchical, meaning the government is the final say of this matter, and uh, that we should adapt existing regulation to now cover cryptocurrencies in a way that makes sense. Whereas there's another group of people who say that due to the nature of this technology and how incredibly transformative it is, where now money can move at the same speed as information, at the same speed as an email, it's intrinsically global, and it's impossible to really know how much people are really making because of this new paradigm, that it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to actually regulate it in a conventional sense. As an example, if you take a look at how conventional MSB regulation works, money service businesses, uh, it's not the regulatory agency that acts as the watchdog. They actually delegate their eyes and ears to the financial institutions themselves. We have a notion of something called a suspicious activity report, which says if your customers, you the bank or you the exchange, are doing business with, are doing something that seems a bit suspicious, you have a legal obligation to report to the regulatory body on your customer. So what does that mean? That the regulatory bodies have turned all of the money service businesses into their eyes and ears, into their watchdogs, and by extension have a pretty good handle on the conduct of everybody using those pipelines. But when you move to a cryptocurrency setting, there is no longer that third party to file a suspicious activity report. And as a consequence, the only way that the regulatory body is going to get data on these people is either A, finding it themselves, or B, having people report it, self-report. Which, uh, which generally doesn't work out so well. So when we look at the totality of this problem and the fact that a lot of the tools that regulators traditionally use to maintain control over the markets and a lot of the tools that regulators need to use to uh, maintain order are not present or superseded by cryptocurrencies advancement, uh, as well as the very rapid advancement of cryptocurrency technology, it does seem to be a, a pyrrhic, almost Sisyphean effort. Uh, to, uh, to actually regulate the cryptocurrency markets the way it's done in the legacy system. That said, if there is no regulation, there are no controls, it's the Wild West, you will unfortunately see the consequences of a lack of control, of anarchy. There will be scams. There will be plenty of people who run around and um, defraud people because they know they can and they can hide in some jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, there's kind of a good, a bad, and an ugly to all of these things. My personal opinion is that we need to take a measured hybrid approach. There are cases where we probably can institute effective legacy regulation. And there are cases where we can use things like self-regulatory organizations, voluntary standards, things like smart contracts to compensate for the fact that these markets are different and also start enforcing best practices. And the other point is that if the consumer of the market knows that they have to look out for themselves, they start making accommodations for that. But one final point of caution, which is if governments do choose to take 
too draconian of a measure on cryptocurrencies. This will not stop the market. There's never been really a case in human history where there's been a demand for something and the government decides to ban it where all of a sudden people stop using it. From prohibition to the war on drugs, all of these things, uh, we've spent trillions of dollars, put many people in jail, and yet these black markets continue to grow. So if there's utility and demand, uh, there will always be a way. And the problem with cryptocurrencies is that they're just so darn hard to stop. Uh, it's as anonymity technology improves, as these peer-to-peer -peer protocols become more resilient, as they start working their way into mobile devices, it's going to become harder and harder to know how much people even make every year uh, unless they self-disclose these things. So if we look to analogy, for example, the, the Hollywood's war on file sharing and the lack of success that they've had there, if regulators do choose to have a very aggressive stance, in my belief, it's not going to actually protect any consumers. It's just going to reduce the overall availability of information and, and ultimately cause um, more harm than good. I think the biggest risk of ICOs is not necessarily the specter of government intervention or this idea of is it a scam or not. It's more that because of this disintermediation that's occurred by the nature of the technology, the people who conduct ICOs tend not to have as strong of a relationship with the people whom have given them money. You know, there's an unspoken and sacred bond when you run a business. Uh, when somebody capitalizes that business, gives you money, you have a relationship of trust with that person. That person had to work really, really, really hard to get what they have. And what they've done is they've taken it, voluntarily given it to you. And you're going to go and take that money and hopefully you know, build it up, make it strong, and come back with more of it, more value for them. If it's a donation, that's fine, you know, but it's the same notion. You've taken their money and they want you to go do something, maybe build wells in Africa, what have you. So the issue is when you now no longer know whom you are getting money from, there is a tendency to dehumanize these people, to say, I have no relationship with them. I have no obligations to do anything for them. I don't have to care about them. And if you read a lot of the terms of sale for the ICOs that have recently been coming out, they're using semantics such as, this is a donation, there's no expectation of return, there's no expectation of delivering a product. If we take the money and go to the French Riviera and just uh, decide to live an opulent lifestyle for the next five years, you can't sue us, these types of things. Now, under ordinary circumstances, no investor in the world would ever agree to that and ever finance a business that has that kind of prospectus. But because of the nature of these markets and the fact that there's going to be liquidity and the initial investor may be able to resell that token to somebody else and recruit their investment regardless if the project ends up being successful, it has created a moral hazard. And this is something that the community, regulators, and investors in general need to have a broader discussion about how we're going to overcome this. For example, there needs to be segregation of capital. If capital is raised, it needs to be stored somewhere where the people who have raised it don't have immediate access to that capital, and there are some sort of controls over that. Second, there needs to be a better relationship between the buyer of the token and the person delivering the project. Now, it's not completely unfair to, to say that this lack of a relationship is solely because of the negligence of the person issuing the ICO. In some cases, because of draconian or very out-of-date securities laws, just by giving basic investor protections and basic investor participation, you're tacitly admitting that this thing ought to be regulated as a security. That's a very unfortunate artifact of old laws that ought to be updated, where they're intended to protect somebody, but in consequence, to avoid them, people are actually diminishing consumer protections. So basic things like this need to be thought about and done, and it goes back to best practices and community standards. Where do these standards come from? They come from failure. So if you want to know how to run a secure, good cryptocurrency exchange, you look at the people who'd ran insecure, bad cryptocurrency exchanges and say, what did they do wrong? Just like if you want to build a rocket, you look at the rockets that exploded and you say, what did we do wrong? And from those failures, you learn tremendously quickly on how to change things. And we've seen a, a tremendous evolution already. There's a lot more formalism occurring with the ICO markets. There are now ICO rating agencies, for example. They're very preliminary. They are starting to create some things. And eventually, there will be stronger regulation. And hopefully, that regulation will be quite intelligent and sensible and guide the market in the right direction. If it's not intelligent, not sensible, then unfortunately, as I said before, it's likely to result in um, the market becoming actually worse for consumers, not better.
Uh, I love the oil and gas business. I've had a lot of friends and family who have uh, been in these industries. Uh, and uh, if you look at how natural gas or oil or gold or any commodity is treated in the Western world, these are you know, very competitive, reasonable markets. And you know, people have an expectation that there should be uh, a fair value for what they're extracting. And that's somewhat predictable. But if you go to the developing world where they don't have the expertise, the credibility, the infrastructure, and other such things to actually develop their resources, for example, Guinea with its bauxite has nearly a third of the world's supply of bauxite, what they end up having to do is go to China or to Rio Tinto or these other firms and make very predatory deals where they get pennies on the dollar for these natural resources. And they accept bribes or they accept some infrastructure play. But at the end of the day, they're literally selling something that could be worth $100 for a dollar or less. So what if you could actually tokenize the development of natural resources? So you say something like, okay, we're going to survey this field for oil, or we're going to survey this field for a bauxite or for diamonds, and then we're going to tokenize the entire production, and each token represents some ownership stake of that. Now, this kind of uh, a way of going about things is not completely new. It's been proposed before, but now because of all these tools and cool things that we're getting in the cryptocurrency space, it gives us many more levers that we can pull to prevent corruption and to prevent um, theft or other such things from occurring or cut off the flow of capital in the event that an agency failure occurs, even on the government side, perhaps. So this will allow smaller jurisdictions that really do want to compete on the global markets to actually get a fair price for their resources, which in turn they can use to reinvest in the community. As a corollary to that, if you look at infrastructure, for example, energy, water, all of these types of things, we're moving from a centralized model to a more decentralized model. You know, it wasn't too long ago that Tesla announced the solar roof and then before that the power wall. But basically what they're doing is proposing a decentralized grid. So wouldn't it be a wonderful world to say instead of having to build a $50 million or $100 million power plant to go provide energy for people in Ghana or people in Nigeria, for example, why don't we instead build a solar grid or a wind grid and have that be community-owned? And these tokens actually represent ownership of that grid, and they can be ICO'd. So everybody in the world can now make money from a Ghanaian uh, energy farm that's providing cheap, clean power to people in this jurisdiction. Or if we talk about, for example, foreign aid, instead of saying we're going to just give all this foreign aid to some hegemony in the country and hope they do a good job, foreign aid can now actually be participating on the open markets. The UN, for example, could buy some of these tokens in order to promote the development of water and promote the development of solar and actually get a return on these tokens. These are like new opportunities that are incredibly exciting to me, and, and they can do everything from creating a decentralized internet via a mesh net to things like utility services to the tokenization of natural resources. And I think this is going to be one of the great fun challenges to explore over the next 10 or 20 years as this technology matures. My great hope for cryptocurrency technology is that we stop talking about blockchain and Bitcoin and all of these things. We no longer talk about TCP IP in the general public. You know, in the early days of the internet, the only people who used it were very sophisticated, very technical people, and uh, they were capable of doing so much. And that was because the internet could do so little, and they had to carry the load for them. So things like TCP IP and, uh, and these ideas, they kind of faded into the backdrop. They're necessary, they're useful, technologists iterate and evolve and build things on top of them. But at the end of the day, the consumer doesn't care. The consumer looks at things like, does my Skype work or not? You know, am I having a good high quality call or is it crackly and there's high latency or something like that? If we can achieve the same thing we've achieved with the internet, that it just works and it just works well, but do that for money, then I think we can have some really magical revolutionary things. For example, I believe we'll have this idea of a universal wallet. Just recently, I was actually on a trip throughout Europe. I was in Ukraine, I was in Greece, I was in Switzerland, and I was in London, in England. And all these countries have one thing in common, which is they have different money. So Ukraine's money is different than the euro, which is Greece's money, is different from the franc, which is uh, Switzerland's money, which is the pound, which is England's money. But I never once used a currency exchange, and I never once used the local money. I had my card, and every time I bought something, that card would go from U.S. dollars to the local currency. So I actually didn't care what the local currency was. I just had to kind of in the back of my mind track what am I spending. So could you imagine a future where all of your assets live in a wallet, a digital wallet, 
where you have some tokenized gold and tokenized stock, but even more exotic things like tokenized airline miles, or you know, maybe you, you know, tokenize your house and sell part of it. It's like a reverse mortgage and you have some tokens in there. Maybe you pre-sell your labor and you put it there. And then when you go into Starbucks or to McDonald's or any of these places, they always will charge, let's say, in dollars. So when you go and tap your cell phone to pay, you're going to pay in airline miles or your labor or your house, and they get dollars. They didn't know that you paid in airline miles. That some decentralized market-making network took care of all that process. Now, if we can get to that reality, we start caring a lot less about our local money. It doesn't really matter if you live in Argentina and the peso is not doing so good because you can just rebalance your portfolio and say, you know, I'm actually pretty long on the dollar. I'm just going to go for that. Or I like gold, so I'm going to store all my wealth there. So now what we've done is we have taken a person where their financial life is determined by geography, and we've now put them in the driver's seat of their financial life. They get to make the final say about their portfolio and how they store their assets. And by the way, every single one of these assets are going to be secure. They're going to be well accounted for. They're going to be free of fraud or a lot more resistant to fraud. They're going to move at the speed of light. You're going to be able to buy and sell them at a fair price. And there's no longer a, a siloing effect that occurs where your equities live here and your bonds live here and your currencies live there and your commodities live there. They're all just treated as the same under the same type of protocol and they flow just as fast as email. If we can accomplish that by 2030, I think that the cryptocurrencies have, will have become the greatest innovation of the last 500 to 1,000 years since the invention of banking and the invention of the printing press. And that'd just be an amazing future to live in. <laughs>